So imagine the potential we had for anger erupting in this country when that was what was really going on in places. And that was genteel Virginia. Okay, my experiences are Virginia. Couldn't wait to get out of here. Couldn't wait. Didn't think it was a very fond experience for me growing up. So I decided I'm going to go to an all-black, historically black college, HCBU, BU, whatever they call them, <laughs> B, whatever they call them. Um, and I was going to be nurtured and loved. I was going to get myself back where I felt like I had a social life and had a chance to interact with people that might not automatically reject me. So I go to Clark College in Atlanta. Now, my parents aren't too happy with this concept, needless to say. But we did agree on that because I had an aunt who had been dean of women at that school. And so it was OK for me to be far away and because I still was a little hellion. And uh, there was a relative there to kind of keep me in check <laughs> for Southern Florida. <laughs> so I go there. First thing that happens to me is I'm sitting. This is, I mean, these schools have people that have been there forever. So I'm sitting in a classroom, first day I'm there in the history classroom, this old professor asks questions. He says, he's asking everybody to tell them their name and where they're from. And I tell him I'm Alda White and I'm from Virginia. He goes, Virginia, what part of Virginia? And I'm thinking, oh, Lord. <laughs> so I tell him. And he said, I taught a white some years ago from Portsmouth, Virginia. His name was Dr. Raymond White. Do you know him? I'm shrinking down under the sea. Because that's my uncle, my daddy's baby brother. He'd been there because his sister, who was the dean of students, had been there. Okay, so it's a family school. And I'm thinking, oh, well, this isn't going to go over very well. I thought I was going to be incognito. So, of course, what happened was they said, oh, so if Dr. White is your uncle, then Dr. Kofer is your aunt. I went, yes. Now, fortunately, my aunt had retired, so I thought I had escaped that. So I go there, and I'm now under another cloud, okay? I'm expected to behave because people know who I am. I'm thinking, Dad, I can't get away from this. I'm expected to behave because I may bring down the race if I act terribly out when I'm in school. Okay, so the whole burden of being black is on my back. Okay, now I go to school and that happens. I'm thinking, okay, I, I got over it. I, I thought I would eventually be found out. I didn't think it would happen that fast. But like Fredericksburg, it's a small place. Everybody knows everybody, so it catches up with you very quickly. But it did take long before I encountered a white professor who gave me an F on the paper. And I went to him and questioned him about it, and this is what he said to me, quote, I've never seen a black student write this well. You must have plagiarized. Oh. This was that nurturing environment I was looking for. I was incensed. I had to go through a lot of changes with the dean and all kinds of other stuff. We got it resolved. He was teaching at a historically black college. His viewpoint was that we couldn't learn, we couldn't write. He knew nothing about me. He knew nothing about me. But that was what happened. So I decided I got to stay here because I made this decision. And my parents have made it very clear. You don't want to go where we want you to go. You're going to stay where you are. So I found ways to get around that. I went to University of Denver on an academic exchange program for a semester. Then I came back to school, and then I got involved in a work study program that sent me to DC for a year. So I ended up spending like three years maybe on the campus total, maybe two and a half, because um, I found ways not to be there because I really didn't want to be there. So I said, OK, this is a farce. Don't worry about it. Let's go on to law school. I apply to law schools, and I decide that I'm going to go to Philadelphia because I've had enough of this Southern stuff. It's not fun. <laughs> so I go to Philadelphia, enroll in Temple University Law School, and I'm excited. So the first day I'm there, I walk into the Black American Law Students Association office, and when I walk in, somebody said, what is that Puerto Rican doing in here? <laughs> I, of course, am shocked because where I came from, you were either black or white, and there was no variation in between. And depending upon how dark a light you were, you might be able to get away with it. But you know, it wasn't this, oh, well, we're this, we're that. Well, when I got to Philadelphia, I found the world was different. Now, my, my northern friends will tell you, oh, we didn't have the segregation you had in the south. That is not true. 
what they had was the Jews live here, the Poles live here, the Italians live here, the this group lives there, and they were very polarized by neighborhood. Okay, they, and, and they would tell you that, but then they would make you think that it had nothing to do with race or where people came from, which is not true. Because the entire time I spent in Philadelphia, I had long hair then, and people thought I was Hispanic. People come up and talk to me in Spanish, and I look at them like, <laughs> okay? So, again, the reason why I tell people, don't tell me you don't notice my color, because clearly there is some identifier that makes people think you fit somewhere. And once that opinion is formed, you go forward from that point. So that was like an eye-opener. After three years in Philadelphia, I said, I can't navigate these rules. These are much more complicated. I packed up my bags and came back to Virginia. <laughs> That's the truth. Came back to Virginia, and because I hadn't gone to Virginia Law School, Virginia's very provincial. Because I hadn't gone to Virginia Law School, nobody would hire me because they didn't think I could pass the bar. Because the Virginia bar is designed for people that don't go, it's designed for people that go to Virginia law schools to pass because they have a whole day, basically, where they test Virginia procedure, which obviously is not taught at Temple, okay? <laughs> and so I came back to Virginia, and the only job I could get was, in, was with legal aid in Emporia, Virginia. And for those of you that don't know the geography of Virginia, Emporia is on the North Carolina-Virginia border on 95. Very rural place. But they would hire me without <laughs> having a license. So I took the bar exam in the summer, I went to work in August, and I was barred the first time out because I was determined I was only doing that one time. Uh, and I passed the bar and was licensed in October. Well, my days in Emporia were interesting. While I had lived in segregated Virginia, and I wasn't really worried about being in Southside Virginia because I had lived in Southern Virginia, I knew what that was like. But I just was not totally prepared for the small townish nature. One of the first things I did when I went there was to go to register to vote because my parents were voters. And I remember going to the polls with my parents even when they had to pay poll taxes. This was something that I was taught young that you have a responsibility to do. So I go to register to vote. It's not my first time registering to vote because 1972 was the first time that you could vote for president at 18 years of age. So I remember doing that. Um, but in any event, I go there to register to vote, and the, registrar, the registrar's office was a part-time office. It was only open on Saturdays. So I go Saturday morning to register, and the registrar looks up at me. She says, who are your people? And I said, I'm not from here. So she starts digging in a drawer and pulls out the papers, and she says, what's your name? And she begins to write. She says, spell it. And I said, I can fill out my own form. She goes, no, you're not allowed to do that. And she starts, whatever. And then she starts asking me all these questions. When did you come here? Who do you work for? Et cetera, et cetera. I'm getting irritated because I know what's happening. I said, is that on the form? She didn't respond. I said, if you will just give me the paperwork, I'm filling it out myself. No, no, I have to do this. So she continued to fill out the form. It was a horrible experience. I was livid. And mind you, I'm fresh out of law school. I think I know everything. <laughs> okay. So I immediately go to the president of the NAACP and I file a complaint. Ultimately, my complaint became a part of the Lawyers Committee on Civil Rights um, abuses throughout the South that ended up being a part of the 1982 extension of the Voting Rights Act, which is, again, under assault. Um, but it was, when I tell people that, that was 1979, 1979, so the Supreme Court recently ruled that the Voting Rights Act had done this thing, and you don't need that protection, okay? Voting Rights Act came in, I think, originally in 64, maybe 65. We don't need to pre-clear these local communities because they all do things right. They understand what the rules are. Well, in 1979, they didn't understand the rules in Emporia, Virginia, because they told me I couldn't fill out my own forms. Have you ever been told that? I bet not. So I'm going, OK, I have to adjust again. Now, in Emporia, that was a great experience because they were used to black people being there. But they weren't used to black people being there being lawyers. <laughs> Although Sam Tucker, some of you may have known him, Sam Tucker was with the firm of Hill Tucker Marsh, actually lived in Emporia, and, but his office was in Richmond, so he would come through periodically. And so, but I mean, he, Sam Tucker was like 
the Sam Tucker. So that was like different from me. <laughs> so, I mean, I had my moments. I had lots of moments. But one of the things that happened there that actually changed the way I viewed the world was a family issue that was very intimate and it just kind of shook me to my core and it allowed me to see the world in a different light. My father brought my grandmother down to my office so she, he could see, she could see what I did for a living. And when she came down there, I introduced her to my secretary and I said, Grandma, this is my secretary, Lois. And I said that three times, my grandma kept looking at us and said, girl, are you Laverne's secretary? I have an unalbum. Girl, are you Laverne's secretary? And she kept saying, yes, ma'am, yes, ma'am. Shaking her head, yes, ma'am, yes, ma'am. And my, my grandma looked at us and she said, but girl, you's white and she's colored. Mm -hmm. That was when it struck me that this race thing wasn't just one way. My grandmother couldn't fathom. She knew I was a lawyer. She knew what I'd accomplished, but she couldn't fathom that the world had changed so much that she could have a grandchild who had a white person that worked for her. That allowed me to grow and understand I had to develop some form of empathy when I encounter people and not to necessarily be angry. Now, I, I wasn't outwardly angry because I wouldn't be standing here probably. But I would fume, it was very disconcerting to me as I encountered experiences as I went through life. Um, but that was something that caused me to take a pause and think about it. So I try to tell people now, when you're dealing with issues of race, we all should just kind of take a pause, have a little empathy, and try to put yourself in that other person's position. If nothing else, that will help you get to <coughs> space. So needless to say, I leave Emporia and I come to Stafford County. I was interviewed by the county attorney, who was a white guy, and his secretary. They were in a building separate from the courthouse, so I had no idea what the courthouse crew was like. He hires me, he tells people he's got an assistant coming her name, and he doesn't even say, he doesn't tell my gender. The assistant's name is Alda White, and I show up. I'm not at all what anybody's expecting. First, they didn't know if Alda was male or female, and they certainly didn't expect Alda to be black. And I come to Stafford County, and Stafford is a wonderful place. It is the place where I spent my career. But Stafford was a place where almost everybody was related to everybody else. <laughs> and they all worked in the courthouse. <laughs> or the sheriff's department, or the schools, or wherever. Um, and interestingly enough, it was the first place in my life I'd ever been where the janitors were white. And when I saw that, I knew I was in deep trouble. <laughs> okay, I knew I was in deep trouble. I'm like, what did you do this time? <laughs> well, you know, people were nice to me, but they didn't know quite what to say or do. This was, I was new to them, they were new to me. So they would say to me, do you know John Scott? And I said, no. And they'd say, he's a lawyer in Fredericksburg. Well, that didn't have to go on, but so long before I figured out he must be black. <laughs> so I decided, no problem, I'll just ask somebody the next time they ask me if I know this guy. So somebody asked me, and I said, look, please don't get embarrassed, because I knew what I was doing was going to be over the edge. I said, please don't be embarrassed. Is he black by chance? To which the response was yes. The person turned big red. I said, don't be embarrassed. I'm just trying to figure out why everybody thinks I should know this one lawyer in Fredericksburg. <laughs> I knew Fredericksburg was big enough to have more than one lawyer in it. So I go back to my office, I call him, I use my title get, to get through. He picks up the phone, he says, hello, John Scott speaking. I said, hello, Mrs. Scott, my name's Elder White, and I'm the assistant county attorney in Stafford, and I'm black. He fell out laughing. <laughs> <laughs> he invited me to lunch, and that's how I met my husband. <laughs> so Stafford was good for me. I was a single girl when I came here. I ended up getting married. As I said, I was passing through town. I had no intentions to stay. He's now deceased and I'm still here. So I mean, he obviously brought me here and it was a good thing for me. So it's not always bad to have these kinds of incidences happen. It's just a matter of how you approach things when they happen. So I tell that story in just because it's a good story. Um, in time, everybody got to know me. They knew that I was a hellion, that I would raise, I'm looking at you, Trav. <laughs> they knew I would be a little whatever, but it all worked out. It all worked out just fine. 